Hello, my name is Fabienne Powell, and I'm Chief Curator with the New York State Office of General Services. On behalf of OGS and Commissioner Moy, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for tonight's live stream event, as well as everyone who has helped to create this experience, especially the OGS Curatorial and Visitor Services team for their research and exhibition development, the OGS Media Services team for setting up tonight's event, and Governor Hochul's Executive Chamber LGBTQ Plus Affairs team for their insight. I'd also like to take a moment right now to remember those whose lives or the lives of loved ones have been lost or altered as a result of phobic hate and violence. Each June, New York State mounts an exhibition to commemorate the 1969 Stonewall Uprising, an event that we now know as the turning point in the fight for civil rights of LGBTQIA people. This year's exhibit, With Dignity and Pride, which is now on view in the New York State Capitol, spotlights the struggle for equal rights of LGBTQIA service members in the U.S. military and shows how New York State continues to support the fight against discrimination, inequality, and hate. Since the Revolutionary War, LGBTQ Americans have served with honor and distinction in the United States Armed Forces. Yet, until very recently, this community of individuals were largely prohibited from serving by practice and policy and often found themselves dishonorably discharged and humiliated. Even today, restrictions remain for individuals identifying or presenting as non-binary or intersex, leaving a large spectrum of gender and sexual identities isolated and without equal rights. For example, Despite countless LGBTQIA people serving throughout World War II alone, approximately 9,000 LGBTQIA plus service members received discharges during that war, barring them from receiving veterans benefits and negatively impacting their employment, their housing, and their reintegration into civilian life. Many were also forced into detention facilities and mental institutions. Fast forward from World War II, and these examples of individual stories of servicemen and women become more prevalent, which brings us to this evening's conversation. Tonight, we're lucky enough to have with us for discussion three very integral individuals to this exhibit whose stories we, we certainly need to tell. Vincent Ciani uses photography, audio, and text to investigate social justice issues, community, and memory. He teaches photography and theory, including queer visuality and identity, at Parsons New School for Design in Manhattan. He's the founder and director of Newburgh Community Photo Project, which is a grassroots community-based organization that teaches photography and activism to local citizens. His first book, We Skate Hardcore, was published at, by NYU Press and was awarded the 2004 American Association of University Press Best Book Design. A major, of, a major survey of this work was exhibited at the Museum of the City of New York in 2006. In 2014, his second publication, Gays in the Military, was published and featured in the New York Times Sunday Review and on the Katie Couric Show. Featured in the current exhibition are excerpts from Gays in the Military, in which the intimate portraiture and oral histories help tell experiences of discrimination, harassment, and civil rights abuses. Siani's photographs have been exhibited nationally and internationally and are represented in numerous public and private collections including the Museum of Modern Art, Rio de Janeiro, the Library of Congress, the Kinsey Institute for Sexual Research, Museum of Fine Arts Houston, George Eastman House, Philadelphia Museum of Art, Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Museum of the City of New York, Brooklyn Museum of Art, and the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. Our next panelist is Monica Helms. Born in South Carolina, Helms served in the United States Navy from 70 to 78 and was assigned to two submarines, USS Francis Scott Key from 72 to 76 
and the USS Flasher from 1976 to 1978. As an activist, Helms was inspired to create a flag for her own community. In 1999, she designed the first trans pride flag, choosing colors traditionally associated with boys and girls, but with a white stripe in the middle to signify those who are transitioning, intersex, or do not identify with a gender. The flag was first flown at a pride parade in Phoenix, Arizona in 2000. In 2003, her advocacy for trans people and trans veterans led to the founding of the Transgender American Veterans Association. And on May 1, 2004, Taba sponsored the first ever Transgender Veterans March to the Wall, where 50 trans veterans arrived in DC and visited the museum, or the Vietnam Memorial. Also making history when they first became the first openly transgender people to lay a wreath at the Tomb of the Unknowns. Also in 2004, Helms was elected as a delegate in the Democratic National Convention, becoming the first transgender delegate from Georgia. In 2014, Helms donated the original trans pride flag to the Smithsonian Museum at their first ceremony, honoring the addition of a collection of LGBT historical items. And in 2019, to mark the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots, Helms was named one of the Pride 50 by Queerty for trailblazing individuals who actively ensure society remains moving towards equality, acceptance, and dignity for all queer people. Also that same year, she published her memoir, More Than Just a Flag. Kristen Rouse is originally from Florida, but has made Brooklyn her home for more than a decade. She is currently the Deputy Director for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for New York State Department of Veterans of Services, and has served as both a non-commissioned officer and a commissioned officer in the U.S. Army, the U.S. Army Reserve, and the Army National Guard for more than 25 years working as an enlisted supply specialist and a non-commissioned officer in the Army Reserve and later in the 10th Mountain Division Light Infantry and more recently as a commissioned logistics officer in the Army National Guard. Rouse served in Afghanistan in 2006, 2010, and again in 2012, leading trips, le I'm sorry, leading troops and logistical missions for the total of 31 months of deployments. She spent nine months deployed as the only female officer attached to an infantry battalion where she served as her unit's primary liaison to the Afghan National Army Unit and was second in command of a company providing resupply convoys and maintenance support for infantry men. She has been awarded four achievement Army Achievement Medals, four Army Commendation Medals, and the Bronze Star Medal. Her civilian experience includes creation of regional and citywide logistics plans and programs for New York City's Office of Emergency Management and teaching literature and writing as an adjunct professor. She has written about veteran and military issues for numerous publications and has spoken about her experiences on CNN, MSNBC, ABC, NPR, and On Second Thought with Trevor Noah. Following her return from her third tour of duty, Kristen addressed the needs she saw in the veteran community by founding the New York City Veterans Alliance. Kristen has been an integral part of the development of this exhibit, writing both for a brief history of LGBTQIA plus military policy and New York State's Restoration of Honor Act. So I want to thank all of the panelists for being here tonight. Ahead of tonight's discussion, I met with the panelists a few times and in one of our con many conversations uh, was about the long history of LGBTQIA plus people in the military and how many individual stories there are surrounding that. Kristen said, we can tell stories all day, but seeing them is everything. So I want to start by talking to Vincent a little bit about uh, your process and your inspiration for this project. These portraits are so intimate, especially 
for people who've had for so long been unable to serve the military in an authentic way. So could you just tell us a little bit about the genesis of the photo essay and what the subject's reaction was when they saw their faces and their stories in such a brave and public way and what that might have meant to them? Uh, thank you, Fabian. And first, I want to say thank you to you and everyone involved in putting together uh, this exhibition and also this panel discussion. I think it's um, certainly very worthy and very much needed to have conversations like this uh, so we can move our society forward in the most uh, equitable way as possible. Um, as a documentary photographer, most of my projects um, have a genesis in my experiences in my own life. Um, either where I live geographically uh, or things that I'm involved in or things that I'm very passionate about. Um, Gays in the military started um, not even understanding or knowing what I was going to do uh, with the project. But one afternoon, um, it was around, uh, I had just moved from Brooklyn to Newburgh, New York. And I was living, li listening to the local national public radio. And I believe it was 2008 or 2007 or 2008, um, just when the elections were, um, uh, the 2008 elections were at, at their height. And there was a mom who uh, was being interviewed by a local radio station uh, broadcaster about her son who was recently discharged a 19 year old uh, named uh, Nathaniel Bowden. Um, and as I was listening to the interview, I was really moved uh, by how much the mother um, supported him, uh, the pride she had and the love she had for him. Um, at the time I was doing some tangential work uh, with supporting organizations that were working to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which was one of the most devastating laws and policies um, that was ever instituted um, uh, with the, in the US military. Um, so I contacted the woman since she lived in the area. I just looked her up in the phone book and uh, contacted her and asked if I could uh, interview her son and photograph him when he came back. Uh, he was you know, discharged when it would be about three or four months before he was out processed. Um, so he was the initial person. I photographed him in the, in the meantime, before I went to the interview and made the photographs, I started reading on the history of uh, the gay ban in the military, numerous books that are written. Um, and I was really astounded by the facts uh, that were presented in many of these books. Uh, so I started doing more and more research. I started paying more and more attention to what was happening politically. Um, I became involved in uh, lobby days um, in Washington, D.C., and I slowly but surely built up a um, list of people, or, or I met people, um, that I thought I would photograph. Let me say that, uh, you know, this happened after I um, photographed and interviewed Nathaniel Bowden, but reading all this, uh, all these books, and then starting to see uh, what was happening in the media um, made me realize that it was a much larger story than one single person. Because my intention was to actually follow him throughout his readjustment into civilian life. Um, research is a really big part, is a very important part of, of my projects. Um, and my projects usually last, you know, anywhere from three to nine years. And I really go in depth. So over the three or four years that I was working on this, I traveled about 10,000 miles across the United States in four or five road trips. Um, and I built up um, um, appointments with people that I met either online through Facebook, uh, from the media, names that I called from the books that I read, and then also people who were recommended to me by other um, service members or veterans that I had photographed. And the most astounding part of it is that I have to say that I was never in the military. Um, you know, when I was, when I, was um, I guess, uh, coming into my political consciousness, it was during the Vietnam War. 
um, and I demonstrated against the war. Uh, so I had, even though I was gay, I had little understanding of what it was like to be an LGBTQ plus person in the military and what that meant in terms of leading your life to the fullest and also openly and honestly. Uh, and the fact that you could not do that and what psychological impact that could have on, on people. Just by joining the military, you're actually um, going against, and this is, these are words that came from some of the subjects, you're going against what really the military stands for, honor, truth, justice, okay? Um, so as I entered into, um, into, into these people's lives, there were people that I did not know. Um, Sometimes I built up a relationship uh, over telephone or email uh, or Facebook, um, but pretty much most of the people that I photographed across the United States were people that I just met for the first time. So their trust in me uh, was a gift in a way. Um, and when I entered into their homes, I had the responsibility to um, to give them the dignity and also the respect uh, for their experiences um, and what they went through and also the service that they performed for our country. And in conversations with them, you know, there was always a discussion of what is service to country um, and it's many different things. You know, they came from many different backgrounds, many different um, uh, races, uh, ages, uh, I photographed uh, people all the way back to veterans from World War II, all the way up to recent enlistees in the military. So it was such a diverse group of people, and I wanted to show that diversity because essentially our community is made up of extreme of an extreme diverse population uh, in many different ways. Uh, so we relate to the, our community in in multiple different ways. I think what moved me the most was their ability to open up uh, to someone that they hardly ever knew, that they hardly knew at the time. Um, and the interviews would last anywhere between an hour and a half or four hours long. And a lot of times we dealt with issues and talked about things that they hadn't spoken about for a while. They just kind of put back in the, their consciousness uh, or things that they never really thought about um, understanding what their experiences were. Um, for the most part, I think that the, the most common thread was they had a need to tell their story. And there wasn't anyone at the time, you know, other than the activism that was taking place to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell. There wasn't anything at the time to relay the stories of people who make up the history of LGBTQ people in the military. Um, they were profoundly grateful, but I have to say that I was much more profoundly grateful to them uh, for open up, opening up their lives um, and being so open and honest with me, welcoming, welcoming me into their homes um, and putting the trust in me that I would do justice to their story. I think when um, the interesting thing about it is I, I'm still in touch with some of them, uh, but for a very long time, there was a continuous conversation uh, that I had, which is kind of a normal thing with, with most of my subjects. Um, I always build friendships up outside of the project itself. And that's because I think when I approach projects, I approach it as a collaboration rather than a project that I'm doing. Uh, and I really depend on the subjects to be part of that conversation uh, and to tell their own story in their own voice. Um, one of the strongest relationships that I had, friendships that I had for quite a while was someone who was politically opposite than I was. I mean, our mm -hmm. politics were at extreme ends of the, of the spectrum, but we were still able to find common ground uh, to become friends and to have discussions civilly um, and also um, in a very respectful manner. And I think that's one of the things, one of the most, another more very important thing that came out of this project 
was understanding people's stories were going to be very, very different and their perspectives, their politics, uh, the way they see the world uh, are very different, but we're coming together on common ground. That's so much trust to put into one man with a, a camera <laughs> to tell a story that's been so hidden for so long. What, um, what was the first time that they saw the work? Was that at the Museum of the City of New York at that show? No, I would, um, I mean, as I got worked more and more on the project, I would delve, I delved more deeply into the activism around Mm -hmm. Don't ask, don't tell. Um, and I established relationships that were, I continued on almost on a daily basis with some people, but uh, I sent them images of the photographs uh, as I worked through the project. Many of them posted them on their mm -hmm. Facebook page or used them as their profile pictures. Mm -hmm. And there were emails back and forth or messages on Facebook back and forth. So the relationship, I, even after I photographed them, photographed and interviewed them, continued to grow and the friendships. And, you know, there were a few times that I would return back to the locations where, uh, where they lived and I would get in touch with them and we would meet up for, you know, a coffee or dinner or something like that. Uh, one mm -hmm. of the subjects uh, invited me to stay in uh, he and his partner's house uh, when I was going to Atlanta, Georgia, as a matter of fact, um, for something else. Uh, so, the relationships, you know, were um, were firmed up over a long period of time. I still keep in touch with a handful of them, um, and there's um, they still uh, acknowledge the fact that being part of this project made them had gave them the ability and the chance to tell their story and become visible hmm. uh, because the whole idea of being LGBTQ plus in the military was that you had to remain invisible. Yeah, I, one of our conversations um, that took place, I think it was multiple times that it came up was um, in your in your project, uh, reading through the interviews, n not one of, of them had mentioned uh, being trans. Um, and, you know, we talked a lot about that and the fact that uh, trans people were not acknowledged in the military at all at that time. Um, and so um, I kind of want to ask, uh, kind of switch to, to Monica and Monica's story. Um, it was just about 20 years after uh, Gilbert Baker, who's also a veteran, uh, worked to design the first eight stripe rainbow flag in 1978. Monica, you you met with Michael Page, the designer of the bisexual flag. What, uh, what was that conversation and, uh, and your story behind that? And how did that come into that conversation and that design? Well, at the uh, early part of my transition, I uh, thought that I was bisexual. So I joined uh, Binet USA. And Vinet had a um, uh, a conference in Phoenix one time, and so I got a chance to meet with with uh, Michael Page. And Michael Page and I sat and we when we were having dinner, and and uh, he said, you know, the trans community could probably use a flag too. And you know, I never gave it much thought, but then I started thinking of different things, and. I, he said the, the most important part of that was keep it simple because the least amount of uh, stripes is uh, least amount of stitches and it costs less to make <laughs> and to sell. So it was about two weeks later when uh, I woke up one morning and a design hit me while I was still groggy in the morning and uh, I thought it seemed to be pretty good idea and I got up and drew it out and I liked the way it looked and it uh so I I contacted the people that made the bisexual pride flag and they sent me some swatches and after I picked the ones I wanted I contacted them and they and a week later <clears throat> I had the first transgender pride flag 
And I was, I was totally amazed at people wanting to know what this was. I took it to all the support group meetings and everything, and, and uh, they liked it. Uh, and the uh, first time I took it for public view was, um, I, I was at the color guard in uh, the Phoenix Pride, and uh, I carried the flag there. And of course, people at Pride were asking me, what's that, what's that? And I had to explain what it was and what the colors meant and, and everything. And uh, uh, so I took it everywhere I went, everywhere I went. I went, took it to lobby days in, in DC. I took it to uh, uh, parades and protests and marches. And uh, I, I took it everywhere and people started seeing it. So uh, they were asking me, well, where can I can get one? And, I, I let them contact the people that, that made the original one. And uh, it just grew from there. And it was in uh, 2013 when I started uh, looking at pride photos from other parts of the world. And I, I saw the colors and I saw the, the flag being shown in other parts of the world. I'm going, oh my gosh, this is, this is crazy. I didn't know. It was that popular. And I still am surprised to see it in various places. It, um, uh, I said, well, okay, I have the original one. I need to find a place to, uh, to put it so it'll be safe. And I said, well, I'll start at the top. And I contacted the Smithsonian and they started collecting uh, LGBTQ items. So they said, yeah, sure but they wanted to make sure that they had every information about this flag <laughs> and all the stuff about me, my history, and especially my military history. And even though they don't have a place to display all their <clears throat> LGBTQ items, <clears throat> excuse me, um, my flag is in a storage area that has other military flags. Uh, so I thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, but um, so 2014, it was the same day that, that I created the flag that I donated to the Smithsonian, which is August 19th. And I consider that transgender flag day. Um, I've seen it on every continent, including the South, South Pole. And I have, uh, there is one place that I do want to see it. And that is the International Space Station. I'd love to see the flag being shown there, but that will be something that other people will have to do. Hey, uh, talking to, to Vince, Vince uh, mentioned, you know, uh, photographing people under Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and, and you actually did not serve under uh, Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Your military service was prior. So as a, a service member and in the Navy and someone with a very specific relationship to uh, the flag and its meaningfulness, of course, of the Navy, the US flag, uh, that how did, how did your use of an object like that to represent something uh, that was so shunned by the military run up against your relationship with the American flag? Well, I served on the USS Francis Scott Key submarine that was the only ship ever named after him. And in the wardroom, they had a replica of the 15 star, 15 stripe flag that he wrote the Star Spangled Banner to. And it was always very impressive to see that flag. And maybe sometime, maybe that had a little um, grab onto my, my psyche and said, you know, I, I uh, served on a, on a special ship like that. And then later on, I ended up creating a flag uh, that was very um, ironic, you might say. But um, I think uh, looking back at, at my service, and I'm very proud of serving as a, as a submariner. Um, and 
that is something that uh, helped me f in my future activism as a trans woman. Uh, started the uh, a friend of mine and I, we were uh, on this uh, Yahoo group, and they were talking uh, talking about stories about their experiences with the VA, and uh, one trans man said that he initially went to Washington D.C. and they just totally rejected him, didn't have, didn't want him anywhere, and so he drove 60 miles north to Baltimore, and they helped him. And I'm going, wait a minute, that's not right. <laughs> what? There's an inconsistency. And Angela Brightfeather and I uh, decided to create an organization called the Transgender American Veterans Association, which is still in pro uh, working at this time. And our goal, our main goal was to get the VA to write up a, uh, some kind of a uh, directive to tell people how to treat trans people correctly. And it was uh, eight and a half years later when we finally re uh, got that in place. At, uh, and it was amazing when the, the directive came out. The next day we received emails from trans men, trans men and trans women saying that the, the new directive worked that they were getting something that they were never getting before thanks to the directive. So I feel that uh, our organization saved lives at that time. I'm very proud of that part. Wow. The, um, it's interesting to, to hear your service from a, a very specific time period and then to look at uh, someone like Kristen, who who did serve under "Don't Ask, Don't Tell," um, and going back to Vincent's photographs, um, who who were also ser serving under a policy like that, uh, which was enacted in '93 and then went into effect in '94. Um, Kristen. You served through the, the repeal, the reenactment, the ban. But you've also served through uh, things like New York State's 2019 Restoration of Honor Act, um, which you wrote about in the exhibit. Uh, and I think if there's one thing that was made clear through the exhibit is that um, the military's concept of readiness is not gender dependent. Um, so I, I have two questions for you. First, if you could just give a little bit of background on gender and identity-based policy in the military, um, and then uh, a little bit more difficult now um, when we're in a time uh, when we're seeing certain states proposing laws that are overarchingly discriminatory um, how do those current state and local policies and laws affect the LGBTQIA plus community? Sure. Uh, thank you, Fabian. And also, I want to say just how grateful I am for this exhibition uh, to be able to see Vince's photography in the Capitol, in our state's capital. Um, and to see this, this beautiful moving exhibition in uh, our Capitol's war room, the, the historic reception room that, um, that, that honors our, our state's military history to, um, you know, if, if you had told me back, um, you know, kind of maybe during my, my, my worst feelings of isolation during uh, the military's don't ask, don't tell policy, if I could have gone back and spoken to that young sergeant, um, you know, to say it's, uh, you know, one day, one day soon, you will get to see not only the end of this policy um, and, and opening of, of the military to, uh, to all able body ready Americans who can serve, um, uh, but, but to say, you know, not, not only will you see the end of this policy, but, uh, but you will see uh, the dignity, uh, the pride and dignity of, of, uh, of, uh, service members who um, who still served uh, under these policies in your state's capital, 
you know, it's it's a really beautiful thing. And I and I thank you and Vince and everybody who was involved in this. Um, and it it was truly an honor to get to be uh, to to get to 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 play a role in this. Um, I mean, so the you know the military has always sort of struggled with this, you know, if, if it's a time of war, we, we, need, we need everyone to play their part. We need all Americans to, um, you know, to, to support their nation during a time of war, um, you know, and, and, and we need everybody to, to sign up and, and serve in, in the ways that, we, that, that they can, but then there's, res there's restrictions. Um, and those restrictions have been race-based, they've been uh, gender-based, and, and it's been such a long history of, uh, of the military catching up with the importance of inclusion and how inclusion supports readiness. It supports the war effort. It supports uh, our national defense. Uh, and even when those, you know, exclusionary policies or restrictions have been in the name of, oh, well, we need to focus on unit cohesion, you know, when unit cohesion is based in trust, not in, not in isolation and, and exclusion. And so, there, you know, there's always been this tension, you know, throughout our, our military's history. And, and, and some of these tensions still remain and still are, are challenges yet uh, to be worked through, um, but but the you know the arc of, of military policy has been towards inclusion, even if there's been some rollbacks or you know or struggles at at times. Um, but you know, but but keep in mind, I mean, just you know, as you mentioned, Fabian, you know, the, uh, this this is this is these are really new policies, and it is so important to be talking about this. Uh, the ability of transgender people to serve in the military in their authentic identities. Uh, is has been only possible fully since January 2021. I mean, this is like a year and a half old, and uh, and it came after I mean, s s like long fights by Monica and and so many others, um, and and also as you know, as we 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 talked about um, the other day, Fabian, like this, uh, it is because it was uh, by executive order um, that can be rescinded. Um, in in a in a future administration, if it is not legislated, um, and so uh, you know, so so keep that in mind. Uh, and there are still exclusionary policies against individuals who live authentically in a binary identity, or who present as uh, biologically intersex, and they choose and they choose to uh, to to live that authentic life. Uh, those those exclusions still remain. Um, and and the military does still struggle with uh, with with in, with in implementing the the policies of inclusion. Um, also, it's worth noting that there were restrictions on the jobs and the roles that women could have officially uh, in the military until 2013. Um, you know, there was a combat exclusion policy for women that was purely gender based, not ability based, gender based. Uh, mm -hmm. And even though women were serving in combat roles all through our conflicts in Iraq, Afghanistan and Syria, uh, they weren't allowed to do so on paper. I'm one of them. Um, you know, my my military record says that I belong to a unit that I didn't actually belong to uh, because I was serving uh, in an infantry battalion. My, to this day, my records show that I was not I was not part of that infantry battalion. I was actually on paper with a different unit, even though you know my entire ecosystem, my entire world was infantry, uh, and you know, and so so it's you know there's 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 still these strange things that the military is doing, um, you know, or has done, and you know, and it and it, that legacy still lives on through the people who are still in the military right now, and and saying like, wow, here you know this this wasn't quite right. Um, but uh, you know, and and don't ask, don't tell has been uh, you know it was legislated. Congress repealed don't ask, don't tell uh, in December uh, 2010, uh, and and that was implemented uh, on uh, so September 20th, 2011. So like even though the law was signed, we we still had to wait. We were all like sitting there waiting <laughs> for for months, and people were actually discharged. Under don't ask, don't tell during that during that waiting period, uh, and and uh, and so it's it you know it was just really a, a strange thing and and uh, um, 
I mean, and also just to like to, to live through that in my military career. I mean, it was a beautiful thing, but also it was just really, you know, really kind of frustrating. And, and, it, and it really highlighted how um, in some ways arbitrary the policy was. Um, and, and there were so many, you know, so many people in the military who, who really, I mean, you know, who, who had, you know, they had your back, you know, and, and they, and they were ready, they were ready for, you know, you know, just straight allies who were like, you know, we, we want to see the end of this too. Yeah. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, but this, this, this has a long history and, you know, and even before, uh, you know, don't ask, don't tell, uh, you know, the, the exclusionary policies for LGBTQ, uh, IA people and identities, you know, it, it goes back to World War II, um, you know, even even as of right now, there's an estimate that there's roughly, you know, roughly 100,000 people out there who were discharged under these exclusionary policies of LGBTQ and I um, individuals. Uh, and it's that's 100,000 people who we guess are still living, who have, who were discharged. Um, many of them were discharged on what we call bad paper, uh, which was a, a, a less than honorable discharge, either a general, you know, a general discharge under honorable conditions or a, uh, you know, or, or an other than honorable discharge or, uh, or a, um, you know, or a, a bad conduct discharge or a, a dishonorable discharge. Like there's, there's many different mm -hmm. grades of discharges. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it could be tied up with many things where somebody was harassed, possibly assaulted because of their identity. Uh, and let's say they fought back and then they would be uh, right. possibly court-martialed for right. attacking somebody when they were the victim, you know? And so, so like, the, you know, these kind of situations. Yeah. And, you know, and that's something that we're trying to address uh, as a division of veteran services with uh, the, the Restoration of Honor Act here in New York State. So that anybody uh, in New York who was discharged under bad paper because of these exclusionary policies uh, can, can come to us as an agency and we will, you know, we will review your, you know, the circumstances of your, um, you know, your military service and your discharge, and uh, and we can we can determine whether um, whether that whether your service was indeed honorable, if not for these policies, uh, and we can restore state benefits, and we can also uh, refer and assist with. Uh, with a discharge upgrade for your federal status, because um, it's a lot of work, but that, that discharge status can be upgraded. Um, again, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of trouble, and it's been made difficult on purpose, but, um, but we can assist with that. I think you and I had a really interesting conversation uh, yesterday about the, uh, how, how policies that are coming out now um, and laws or more broadly affect not just LGBTQIA plus members of the military, but also their family and where they're stationed. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's, it's not just the service member and their identity. Uh, remember that families serve too. Uh, when, whenever you are stationed somewhere in the United States or Europe or even in Korea, your family, your family will go with you. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, like, you know, military base, active duty military bases are just, you know, an entire universe. But, um, you know, but let's, you know, if it, let's say you, uh, your family, like, let's say you, uh, you have a child who is transgender and you want to make sure that they are able to to live in their identity and, mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and live in a place where they're not harassed, live in a place where they do have access to modern healthcare, whether that be mental health care or, you know, or, 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 uh, you know, just standard medical care, uh, you know, up to date with, with modern day practices. Um, if, if, if you choose to do that with your child in a state that now uh, considers you a criminal, uh, if you if you if you apply modern modern medical and psychological practices for your child, if you make that accessible to them, uh, you can you can be put in jail. And so um, you know so like this this is this is a readiness problem for families. Um, you know so like just in at the end of March, the Air Force uh, sent out a policy letter uh, saying that like so the the DoD has a has an a, an exceptional family member program, the EFMP, where if you have a child with uh, with special needs uh, and and that child need is 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 going to be healthier uh, in a different place, 
um, then, then that program allows you as a family to be assigned to a place where your child can receive treatment and, and a healthy environment. Uh, for their condition. And so the, the Air Force at the end of March sent out a policy letter saying that the exceptional family uh, exceptional family member program, uh, they will they will they will honor that for uh, families with children who are transgender or otherwise would be impacted by uh, by um, the, the laws that are being passed in, in these various states uh, so that you can, as a family, be reassigned to a place where your family can remain healthy and, and in a good place and you will not be charged with, uh, with mm -hmm. criminality for taking care of your child. And so, um, you know, so like, the, like the, it has yet to be extended to the other uh, branches of service. Um, but, uh, you know, but this, this is a conundrum now. And, uh, and, and also, you know, if we're looking at uh, sort of the, the imminent uh, repeal of Roe versus Wade, which would allow uh, possibly up to two dozen states uh, to prohibit access to full reproductive care, to include abortion, um, then you have a, you know, a significant number of service members who will no longer be, be able to access modern healthcare. Um, and, you know, in, in a military that continues to, uh, to struggle with the problem of uh, severe sexual harassment and sexual assault, uh, and you do have pregnancies, unwanted pregnancies resulting from, uh, from assault within the ranks. Um, you know, essentially, if you, if you are a, uh, a service member in, in one of these states that, that prohibits abortion, uh, then, then you you may be forced to uh, to have basically your your rapist child, uh, and and it's uh, it, you know there, there's there's many layers of uh, of wrongdoing here, right? Yeah. And and so um, you know like like this this is something that that is being talked about um, in terms of you know legislation like you know or the legislative side um, you know last month. Uh, Senator Gillibrand and several other senators, including Tammy Duckworth, who herself is a veteran, um, they sent a letter to Secretary Austin uh, calling on the Department of Defense to review their policies and to ensure that any service member who encounters uh, a, you know, an unwanted pregnancy is able to, uh, would be able to travel to where they could, they could get that care. Mm -hmm. But, um, but also keep in mind that because of the Hyde Amendment, um, uh, any federal facility to include, um, you know, military hospitals or VA hospitals, um, they are prohibited by law right now from even, uh, even discussing abortion as an option uh, with, uh, with patients. Uh, and so they're not allowed to dis discuss abortion and they are not allowed to perform any procedures. So, um, so on any federal installation, uh, they, they, they are already prohibited from just talking about it as, you know, counseling or performing those, uh, you know, those procedures and any, any abortion uh, or reproductive care uh, that, you know, that a pregnant person would, would seek out um, would have to be on their own dime. And and they would have to travel and pay their own dime, you know. But but so like yeah. this, you know, this presents a lot of difficulties. It's amazing to you know look at this holistically and see how far we've come as a state and as a nation, and how far we have yet to go with this. Right, um, and it and it poses a, a, a you know a recruiting problem. I mean, it, it right. it's it, right. you know would would a uh, you know a person who could become pregnant. Uh, possibly by one of their own colleagues in a in some kind of horrific incident. Uh, you know, if if I leave New York where where I'm protected and I am you know stationed in Georgia or Mississippi or Texas or Florida, mm -hmm. um, I will no longer have access to healthcare uh, in the same way that I'm that I would have here. And so you know, like it 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 it, it is already imp impacting uh, recruitment numbers. Um, you know, the, 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 the military is struggling to recruit right now. It's struggling to re recruit women. Uh, and, you know, and again, if we want a military that represents the people it serves, if we want a military that remains strong for national defense, whatever, whatever that may look like, uh, we, we want to make sure that people want to make the military a job of choice. And, uh, and that we have the, the best and brightest uh, Americans in the military ranks. 
And, uh, you know, if we have exclusionary policies, if we are not protecting service members wherever they are stationed uh, and ensuring that they have access to uh, top, the top quality healthcare in the world, um, you know, then, then, then we're going to have a problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think with that, that's a, that's a lot. The, um, I do want to start taking some audience questions. Um, I do know that we do have one from, uh, for Vincent, uh, about, uh, the, uh, about your, your form of activism, which is photography. Um, and in terms of using art and imagery, uh, as a form of activism, what kind of role negative or positive do you think that social media and the proliferation of images online has played uh, within the fight for LGBTQIA plus rights? Um, Vincent and, you know, and Monica as well uh, with, with the flag. Um, I think social media has expanded uh, the possibility of people presenting themselves uh, in a truthful and, um, and honest way. Um, I can use the example of uh, the classes that, uh, that you had mentioned uh, that I teach at Parsons School of Design. Uh, one of the classes is queer visuality and the other one is a class on identity. <clears throat> so we explore these issues, not only of queerness, uh, and how queer people are represented in photography, but also how queer people use photography politically, socially, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I get a wide range of uh, people who are non-binary, trans, um, gay, lesbian, uh, bisexual, et cetera, et cetera. And what I, what I see more and more in my students is that the work that they produce in classes goes on social media almost immediately, or sometimes it goes on social media first before they even present it in classes. Um, so I think the ability of social media to open up the doors to uh, people's, a wide variety of people's uh, realities, uh, lives, um, is, is really pretty powerful. Um, and I wouldn't discount social media for that purpose. There are a lot of problems with social media. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of psychological problems that could happen. You know, ideas of bullying and um, and also even um, um, uh, going after you know children or you know there there are a lot of problems with social media. But in terms of expressing identities, I think it's a pretty powerful tool. Um, as well as looking at political movements, um, you know, wars, despotism, et cetera, et cetera. The, the idea of citizen journalists even is a very powerful tool that brings up a lot of issues um, that we may not have been aware of before. Um, so yeah, I, I fully support social media uh, in terms of supporting um, uh, identities. Monica, what about what about uh, the use of the flag? Do you, do you see that as a? Oh, I lost everybody. Do you see uh, your use of the flag being able to to spread further and wider than you ever thought that it would be able to? Well, on social media, yeah, that was where I basically started seeing it from. Uh, pictures from other countries, uh, and and it was always uh, amazing to see that. And so now I, uh, people, anything special about the flag, people send me links to it, and, and you know, say it, it was flown here at the at the our city hall, or um, you know, it's flown here at at, uh, at this particular country, or we're we're having it here, and and uh, all these various things are, are, are great to see, you know, or people be dressed up in, in trans colors, you know, uh, it's, uh, I just love it. I love seeing all, all this. And then there's even cartoons of uh, people, you know, drawing stuff that has to do with, with uh, 
trans colors and uh, you know there, there's there, there's a there's one that I always like is is uh, a mama bear and the two baby bears one baby bear is uh, uh, rainbow colors and the other baby bear is is trans colors mm. how the mama bear likes to protect her bear, her, her cubs mm -hmm. and so it's it's really wonderful to see uh, I I, uh, I encourage people to send me as much as they can about the flag when it's in different places and that was that would always be a welcome site uh, so I'm a uh, very happy to uh, to see the flag being used as much as it has. Another question we have for Vince is how how did this project push push you artistically uh, in your career? Um, every project that I do as a documentary photographer from the early 1980s explores different modalities of documentary photography. And throughout the years that I've been photographing, um, there's always this element of uh, engagement with subjects outside of the actual photographing. So as, as I progressed during the, my career, um, I, I employed things like um, embedding myself in, in, in places that I was photographing uh, or in communities where people were photographing, actually such as like We Skate Hardcore, in Williamsburg. I lived in Williamsburg for 15 years. I was involved in the community on many different levels, including teaching at a not-for-profit uh, for uh, Latinx people who were uh, just recently um, um, uh, discharged from, uh, from prison uh, yeah. or had drug problems. Um, when I got to, uh, and also the, the kids in We Skate Hardcore, uh, if you look through the book, a lot of some of those images are by them. Uh, the stories are being told by them in their own handwriting, sometimes on the um, on the photograph itself uh, or through interviews. Um, with gays in the military, uh, I, I think it was uh, the project that really brought to light the um, the collaborative aspect of the interviews and the photographing. Um, because we would work on ideas uh, after we had the interview is when I took the photographs uh, so that I understood them more. Um, and I was able to choose locations that best represented them. Um, but now even after that, uh, you had mentioned the New York Community Photo Project. This is uh, a project that's been going on for five years where I'm embedded in the community, New York, New York which is where I live now. Um, and I'm engaged in activism uh, and how photography moves that forward on issues that are related to people who don't have access uh, to marginalized communities or dis, uh, disadvantaged communities. So I've always tied my photography in with my activism. And I should say that my undergraduate degree was in community organizing and radical social politics. So I actually bring that aspect of my education into the uh, photography that I do. Wow. So I want to uh, just, we're gonna, I think at this point wrap up, I want to remind people about the two publications that we talked about tonight. Uh, Vince, uh, your, your book, Gays in the Military, of course, and Monica, um, More Than Just a Flag. Um, these are both available for purchase either through the publisher, I believe, or Amazon online. Um, also a reminder, if you're in Albany to see the exhibition, uh, which is on, uh, on view at the New York State Capitol, uh, it will be up through July. Um, just to remind people that this discussion is recorded and it'll be posted at the empirestateplaza.ny.gov forward slash pride. Monica and Kristen, I wanna thank you so much for your service um, and your, your fight through service. Um, Vince, for your, for your activism and um, the insight to capture uh, these faces and stories that, that everyone should see. 
So thank you so much for everyone, uh, to everyone for joining us tonight. Good night. Yeah, thank you.